Hi, Mommy. Hello, my holy girlies. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Uh, this is episode two of our Holy Girls Chronicles, where we are discussing what is a holy girl versus the society's it girl or that girl, and how does she lead, lead and live her life? How does she follow Christ? And what does she really do? And we're going to be talking about the holy habits that can help strengthen our relationship with God. And if you see me constantly looking down, I have notes. And I have like seven holy habits um, that I have written down that has helped me um, and still helped me strengthen my relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So we're going to get into that. Let's begin. <laughs> weekend I went to my church's women's conference me and my mom um, we went to the women's conference and Priscilla Shire was um, speaking at that conference she was one of the speakers and if you know me personally I love Priscilla Shire I love her I've always loved her since I was a child I love the way she presents topics I love the way that she presents herself I love the woman of God that she is she is just a godly woman that I really want to be she really is like a Proverbs 31 woman of course I don't know her personally her experiences that she has talked about and the advice that she gives um she's just a wonderful woman of god so the topic of the the conference kind of goes hand in hand with a the holy girls chronicles that we're doing that's why i kind of brought this up um and the topic was de being devoted and abide remaining um in christ but she pulled up first john 2 and it was talking about abiding in him because one day he is coming. During our time, we can see now very evidently that Jesus is coming. You can see the signs. You can see that we're in the season of the fig tree that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24. And she was talking about her assign our assignment um, as Christians. And we have to give, give an account of every assignment that we were given we have to give an account of everything that we've done we have to give an account of everything that we said even our thoughts but the bible also says take your thoughts captive submit to god resist the devil and he will flee you know we have to give an account for everything we are ambassadors of christ back in high school um i was one of the ambassadors for the school uh, for one year. You had to be literally the face of the school. And sometimes the school would take us, it was me and a couple of other people from different grades at high school. And we went out to places. It wasn't a fairly new school, but the high school was fairly new. So of course we needed donors, sponsors, and um, you was able to get in that school if you couldn't afford the tuition, you could get on scholarships. Well, in order to get the scholarship, we had to have some donors. We had to have some people who was willing to help the families in the community to get their kids in the school. One of the ambassadors, you had to represent the school without the person even seeing the school yet. They saw you before the school, you were the school. So in the same way, we are ambassadors of Christ if people come to us and they don't know Christ, like they're not Christians um, or ever, or never even heard of the gospel, they look at us and how we live our lives, how we lead our lives, how we lead our families, how we lead our friends, and how we walk with Christ in order to see Christ through us. That That's basically an ambassador. We have to give an account for that when Jesus comes back on judgment day. And the one thing that every Christian should want to strive for, should want to aim for, to hear when we're in judgment day is, well done, my good and faithful servant. So let me start off by reading the scripture that 
Priscilla had gave to us during the women's conference and how that ties in with the holy habits to strengthen our relationship with the Father. So it's 1 John 2, verse. we're going to start at verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Um, I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. Okay? I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Priscilla kind of broke it down to the three stages of a Christian's life. So first we're gonna talk about is the little children. Little children, I write unto you because ye have known the Father. Ye have known the Father. At that point, when you are a baby in Christianity, you have just given your life to Christ, you are trying to learn, you are a new creature in Christ. And you're trying to learn so much about the Father. You're trying to learn so much about Jesus and you're trying to learn so much about the Holy Spirit. You have to isolate yourself. You have to isolate yourself for a period of time I want to say every day to get to know who the father is, get to know his personality, get to know who he is um, in the Old and the New Testament and know his word, know how he says things. Because you're just because you're a Christian, that doesn't mean we don't sin. And when we sin, there's a thing called conviction and then there's a thing called condemnation. We all know that the devil is a copycat. He likes to twist things and pervert things that God, who God is and what he says and what he does. So the Holy Spirit or the father, when you do something wrong or when you sin, he convicts you. It's kind of like a parent when they tell you, hey, don't do that. And this is why you don't do that. And when you have done that thing that they deliberately told you not to do. Yes, you get your consequences, but you know out of the consequences, they still love you, even though they're disciplining you. Where that that's conviction. Condemnation, on the other hand, is what the devil tries to put in your head or the devil tries to put in your ear to combat the love and the correction from the Holy Spirit that is he's like you know oh you've messed up this time there's no way you could come back from this you're you know you're horrible you don't deserve him so why even bother trying to ask for forgiveness why even bother trying to pray why even bother trying to do x y and z that's condemnation so if you know the father <clears throat> and if you know how he talks through his word and being in relationship with him, you're going to know the difference between the two. Like, hey, that's not my father. That's that's not how he talks. So I'm not going to listen to that. And Jesus went into John, John again, John 10. Yeah, it was John chapter 10. Because he talks about being the good shepherd, how he is the good shepherd and how he lays down his life for the sheep. And Jesus goes on and he says, my sheep know and hear my voice so that if somebody else was to come in who tried to pretend like he was the shepherd the sheep would be like nah <laughs> nah that that's not that's not that's not him like that's not him and so we have to be able as a babe in christ we have to be able to soak up like a babe in real life sponge the word of god and know how he know how he is and 
learn how he presents himself in situations um, in the Bible to know that in our situations in our life, we know who to follow. We know who to listen to, our our father. So that starts off one of the holy habits um, on my end is number one is pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians 5 was also talking about the day of the Lord, it was talking about the end times and how when Jesus comes, we have to already be prepared for his coming. In, in verse 17, it says we are to pray without ceasing, meaning we are to be in com constant conversation with God. Prayer is so important. When Adam and Eve was in the garden, they had a direct form of communication, a direct relationship with God because they were pure. They were perfect. When sin came into the world and everybody else who was born after Adam and Eve had sinned, we were born sinful, sinful creatures. We don't know what it means to be perfect. We can't even grasp the idea of somebody or us being perfect because all we know is wrong. We had to have a mediator between us and the Father. And that was Jesus. That was the whole reason why he sent Jesus to die on the cross, so that we could have that relationship, we could have that communication back with the Father. And so when Jesus went away, he sent the Holy Spirit so that when we accept that Jesus has died on the cross and forgiven our sins and confess with our mouth that he is Lord, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, a peace of God, God's Spirit, comes inside of us and lives in us to teach us and guide us and to never forsake us, to never leave us and how to walk as a Christian. If you claim that you have a relationship with someone, you have to talk to them in order for their relationship to work. You have to have communication. If you don't have communication in that relationship, it's gonna crumble and fall. It's the same thing with the father. Talk to him, even though he is all knowing. The whole point of the relationship is that he wants he wants to hear you call out to him. It could be just oh so simple. And it don't have to be long and lavish and um, you don't have to use big fancy words to get his attention. He's, he's always gonna listen to you, whatever is on your heart. As long as you're concrete and sincere, He's going to listen to whatever is on your heart. Nothing is too small for him to handle. Nothing is too big for him to handle. So don't ever think that you're bothering him with situations that you have going on, regardless if it's too big or too small. He is always concerned and want to listen to you. He's always ready. The father's always ready to jump in into your situation. Number two, in a way of strengthening your, strengthening your relationship with God and getting to know the Father is um, reading God's word. The biggest misconception that I have heard when I ask people why they don't talk to God is because they say, well, it's not like God can really talk back to me like how a human being can talk back to you um, or I'm just not hearing from him. Well, my, my question would be, have, have you read his word? Have you opened the Bible? Have you read it? And you can't, the Bible is not just something like you can read one time and like a novel and you're done. You have to keep reading. When you open the Bible, it literally comes to life. You have 66 books in there with thousands of chapters of God actively speaking to the reader. The Bible is the only book that I know personally that the author is in love with the reader so much that he gave his only son to die to have a relationship with the reader. 
So when you open up the Bible, you really take time and you pray for the Holy Spirit to give you clarity, to give you wisdom, to give you a perception of what is going on and whatever you're reading and how to adapt that into your life. You will actively, I promise you, you will hear God speaking to you and it will be the, the more you read, the stronger that voice will be. And the more you read, the more you'll be able to discern who is God and who is not. Who is a friend of God and who is a foe of God. Because we got to also understand, <clears throat> the Bible also does say that Satan comes in as disguised as an angel of light. Don't forget, he was an angel. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure he didn't forget the attributes of an angel when he was casted out. He uses those tactics to prowl around like a roaring lion, lion seeking who he can devour. And he doesn't pop up in your situation or in your life or in front of you, you know, with a pitchfork and horns. <laughs> I'm the devil. <laughs> Hi. No, he's going to try to sound so much because he is a copycat. He wanted to be like God. That's why he was casted out to begin with. He's going to try to sound so much like God that if you do not know the father, if you do not read his word, if you do not have discernment on whose voice to listen to, you're going to end up falling for the wrong voice. And Jesus clearly states again, like I say, my sheep know my voice. They're not going to listen to nobody else. But you can't know his voice without knowing him, knowing how he sounds. Number three is prayer journaling. So I have a journal. Okay, I have plenty of them. Okay, I have plenty of them. And this one in particular right here is the current one that I'm in. It's like praying. And I'm not going to show you because these are letters just between me and God. But most of the situations and either if i have gotten myself into it because i sinned and i knew better or if i was going through a storm and i was going through a tough situation in my life i'm gonna write down in that journal at least a couple of pages long god i need you to show up i need you to show up like today right now and it's so beautiful because when that storm is over or when God has delivered you out of that situation or when he has answered that prayer, you can look back at the goodness of God, the forgiveness of God, the mercy and the grace of God, the love of God, of how that was my prayer request then and the faithfulness of God to where I know my prayer request now or in the future, he will answer. He will show up. And that kind of goes in to the other verse. <clears throat> I write unto you, young men, because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. But if you have ever been in a storm, you just and the lights are going out, things is getting tore up. Or you're so bad in the storm that your life, your house, your things is getting tore up. Um, or even in a house fire. I know Maui, a couple of weeks ago, they have went through, that whole island has went through tremendous of fires, wildfires. Um, even back in my home state, wildfires wildfires just coming left and right and um 
if you ever been through something traumatic like that and everything you know, everything you've ever known, everything that you had is gone and you can't get it back. It will change your whole perspective of life. Same thing in the, in the spiritual realm. If you go through a storm where, or if you're going through a storm right now, and um, I could just name a few things. Either you went through a fire, um, a bad, you know, natural disaster, or something more emotional. Um, you've lost a loved one, whether that be a child, born or unborn. You've lost a parent, you lost a spouse, you lost a, a grandparent, someone that was very close to you, a friend, a sibling. Um, you have experienced maybe someone robbing something from you physically or emotionally. You lost your job, anything like that, anything very traumatic, or even in the pandemic, you lost your sense of freedom. Um, we lost our way of life. If you know the father and you have been in relationship with the father, isolated yourself where it was just you and him, you are letting him, letting him get to know you, be in your situation, fix your situation, stand in your situation with you. And you're getting to know him and how faithful and how true he is. You're able to stand strong in your faith through every storm, every wind, every high water. And at the end of that storm, you're able to stand tall and say God was good. God was good. And you have faith now. Your faith has grown to where, because as, as long as we're breathing and we're living in this world, we're going to go through trials and tribulations. We're going to go through tests. So now you have faith for the next test, for the next trial, for the next storm that God is going to see you through. And have the faith of Rashad, Meshach, and Abednego when they were standing in front of Nebuchadnezzar and they were standing in front of the fiery furnace, getting ready to go in the fire. And they were like, look, I'm standing 10 toes that my God will deliver me out of your hands. But even if he does not, you will know whom I serve today. That kind of puts me into number four, which is fasting <clears throat> and the part of uh, denying yourself. When you're getting to know the father and when you're reading his word and you're talking to the Holy Spirit, he's convicting you about certain things that are in your life and he's refining you and he's putting you through the test so that it's kind of like well, the Bible also said this too, that you are the clay and he's the molder. When you are getting to know the father and he's reconstructing and cleaning your heart, he's kind of like molding and stepping on that foot pedal to mold you into the person that he wants you to be. And don't take of it as a selfish act like he's changing you. I mean, he technically he is changing you. He is he is transforming you. But it's transforming you into a better you. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, the plans to prosper, to have a good life, never to cause harm to you. He is a good God, a merciful God. God is love. So... First of all, if he's already given you the gift of the best gift that anybody could possibly give, which is 
free gift of salvation through his son of Jesus Christ. You don't think that his plan for you will be much better than what you ask, think, or imagine? You don't think that his plan for you would be good as well? He already started up to this point. Why would he fail now? So while you're denying yourself, fasting is a great way to deny yourself. A lot of people like to get scared when they hear the word fasting because all they think of is hunger, no food, starvation. Yeah, that brother's starving. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's not always like that. And don't think of it like that. The more you think of it like that, the more you're not going to do it. Or even if you try to do it, you're not going to finish it. Whatever it is that is uh, putting a block between God being number one in your life is what you need to fast from. The only reason why a lot of people put food is because food is a necessity. If food is more than a necessity to you, like that's what you live for is food, the any given opportunity you're going out to eat, sis, you probably need to fast off of food. If that's in the way of you, if you're putting food first before God, you're idol worshiping. <laughs> Simply, you're idol worshiping. Take that and put God first. Fast off of food. If shopping is your thing, if you're a shopaholic, it could be anything, clothes, shoes, whatever the case may be, home goods, whatever. Does any opportunity that you get and that's what you want to do and that's in between you and God, fast off of that. If it's gaming, okay, your your girl does like the game. Or if it's like technology or any social media and that's hindering the relationship between you and God, that's hindering y'all's communication any given moment. Like that's what you think of when you wake up and that's the last thing you think of when you go to bed. You probably need to fast off that, sis. You need to deny yourself, put God in that place, and let him reconstruct your desires. Let him reconstruct your, pers your perspective. Let him reconstruct your thinking habits. Let him reconstruct everything so that he is number one. Personally, when I fast off of food, I've learned that I, I, get, I go, I'm closer to God spiritually because of the sacrifice that I'm taking food out of the spot of necessity and putting in God as his place. And I can hear him clearer. Uh, I just, I can feel him, his presence surrounding me and he will honor that sacrifice. Number five, replace your secular music with praise music. Um, Now before y'all start, what did he say? Faith comes by hearing. Keep that scripture on you. Faith comes by hearing. In music, we hear it. We hear it, then we feel it. After we feel it, well, we try to relate to it. Take it to consideration of what you're really listening to. So... What I've learned is, and I've gotten rid of all of my secular music. All of my secular music, okay? Um, that was kind of hard for me because if it's a really good bass and it's a really good beat, um, I'm going with it. But you actually have to start listening to the words. And if you're listening to the words and what the, um, the artist is saying, if it's not glorifying God, who is it glorifying? Let's let's be for real. It's, it is it has been taught, believed by, known and studied by theologians that Lucifer was not only the prettiest and beautiful angel known to man but he was also an angel of music. He would orchestrate his music and 
he was an instrument himself kind of with his voice that he would guide everyone or all the angels or all the cherubs to praise and worship God, praise and worship the Father. Until one day he decided, well, I'm leading all these people to him. I can lead them to me. I could be like the most high and somebody could come and praise me. But when he was casted out into the earth with a third of the heaven's angels. Now, you know, he had to be some persuasive. If he had to get the third of heaven's angels, a third. I don't know how many angels is up there, but um, that's still a large number. Okay. A third. That's a large percentage. So think about it this way. If he was able to get the third of the angels, how many flawed people on the earth could he get just through persuasion, his music? In, in music, you kind of think about it, it is a form of persuasion. It can change your thinking. It can change your perspective. So if we have praise constantly on our lips and songs that glorifies God in our hearts, just by listening and replacing our secular music with praise and worship music, we will start becoming transformed. Our minds will be changed by the renewing of our mind, which Re Romans, not Revelation, Romans 12, 2 talks about that we will start being more like Christ. Number six, celibacy. We're still speaking on denying yourself and going through those storms so that you can stand strong. Celibacy, okay? So, celibacy is, if you are single, it is so crucial. I cannot stress about it <laughs> enough. It is very hard in today's society to stay pure to stay a virgin, to stay celibate while you're waiting for your spouse. My ladies, while you're waiting for your husbands, men, if you so happen to fall across a part of this video, while you're waiting for your wives. But when, there, when I tell you there is such a reward in waiting, there is such a reward in remaining staying and abiding in that commitment with God because being celibate <clears throat> that's a commitment to God within itself as Christians we believe we are the bride of Christ okay and it is talked about all throughout the New Testament that since we are the bride of Christ and we're waiting for our bridegroom to return to come and get us we are to stay pure A lot of verses in the Bible compare sin to cheating, okay, um, or fornicating, what the Bible calls it, fornication. And if we go in sin and stay in sin, we are basically turning our back from our bridegroom and we're going to go spiritually sleep around with another person that's how the bible compares sin to fornication when i rededicated my life to christ back in 2020 um august of 2020 before that i was fornicating smoking drinking whatever the case may be um and I said that I believed in God, that I believed in Christ. I believed that he died for my sins. But I was so lukewarm where you really could not tell my fruits. My fruits were not, like nothing was growing. There was no growth. Um, I lived for wrath. I lived for anger. I lived for strife. Um... Uh, any opportunity somebody wanted to fight, I, I was there. I would pull up. 
but when I rededicated my life and I started to getting to know the father and during the time of, um, and of course that was 2020, that was in COVID. So I was not working. So I used that time from August to January to isolate myself <clears throat> um, and really get to know Christ, get to know the father and get to know the Holy Spirit one-on-one -on -one to be in right standing in relationship with God. Now, and, and then I got rid of smoking. I got rid of drinking. I was, I was staying celibate because me and my husband, we did not get married until June of 2021. So from August, 2020, June, 2021, mm -mm, I cut it out. Uh, I stayed celibate. I stayed clean. Now I'm not perfect. So were there times where there was slip ups and we was close and yes, not gonna lie, yes. <laughs> but all in all, I I didn't live in that sin. I turned myself right back around and repented and we both repented and made sure God was still number one in our relationship, reconstructing our hearts in our relationship to not fall back into that. Now that we're married and now that we are having sex, I'm learning so much now that sex is so sacred, it is holy. It's not what the world and society tries to make it out to be, where it's so perverted and it's nasty and it's, you know, in between the sheets and everything like that. No, it is a sacred and holy transaction between a man and his wife and they're becoming one under God in order to have a unity and a type of closeness with that person and then reproduce and being fruitful and multiply and create other human beings who will follow God's will, who will follow God's instructions because they believed first. When a man and a wife are together and they're creating that unity and that bond and that closeness that no one else should, no other man, woman should separate. No other man or woman should come between. The bedroom is so holy. The bed itself is so holy. It cannot be defiled between a man and his wife. It's holy, it's sacred. So that's why it is, it is very, very important. When you're single, enjoy your singleness, enjoy it. Because once you become somebody's wife and somebody's mom, <clears throat> or men, if you happen to see this part of the video, once you become somebody's husband and somebody's father, you don't have the time necessarily for you like you did when you were single. You don't have the time to do the things that you want. You can still do the things that you want to do but your time is limited compared to your family's needs and your family's wants. So, and keep that commitment with God, being single and being celibate. Your reward will be great. I promise your reward will be great. I'm number seven, but let me go into this verse real quick. I have written to you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. My last and seventh point is fellowship with godly people. Fellowship with godly people in order to keep your relationship with Christ, with God strong. Um, it's not good for man to be alone. Genesis 2.18 says that. And Paul in the New Testament talks a lot about how Christians are the unified body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Um, and even when Jesus sent out his disciples, it went out two by two. He never set them out alone. Now, when he died and went ascended back into heaven, 
they did separate after they received the Holy Spirit. But even when they separated, they had the Holy Spirit, so they was really never alone. Having a good group of friends, having a having spiritual mentors, which is like the fathers and mothers that First John 2 was talking about, because you've known the Father from the beginning, from the beginning of your walk with Christ. You've known him for a while. So you're able to invest your relationship with God to somebody else. You're able to tell them, hey, come sit with me or come talk to me and let me tell you how good God has been. Let me tell you what he's done for me. They're able to hold you accountable. They're able to pray with you or for you um, and be able to correct you with love and with guidance through God's word. Um, Y'all can host a small group or a Bible study together and be with you during the hardest times of your life and learn from you from your hardest times of your life. Like if you have a friend who's going through a situation, um, maybe they're praying for a spouse or they're praying for a baby and you went through that already, you went through that storm and that trial of tri trans tribulation, you could invest that and how you remained and how you abide with God and how you was with him and he was with you from the beginning and tell someone else about that. Tell somebody else about God's faithfulness so that their faith can grow in God because of your testimony. And they can say, well, God, if you could do it for this person, I know you could do it for me. So basically, <clears throat> I know this video was kind of long and I didn't really want it to be, but those are the seven holy habits that have helped me and they still helped me um, in keeping my relationship strong through Jesus Christ. And always remember, it is not because of your works. We are not saved through works. We're saved through grace, not by our works, lest any man should boast. Um, that's Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. And so ask the Holy Spirit when you're trying out these holy habits, or if you have holy habits of your own, um, to help you and guide you through the word of God um, so that your relationship with, with the Father will always be strong. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe, share the video, so that it could help other people <laughs> um, and grow and strengthen and their relationship with the father. And um, I'll see y'all again soon. Bye.